All right, it's been a wild week in the business world with basically too many things to list going on with Elon Musk, Biden proposing a new billionaire's tax for unrealized gains, and crypto markets having one of the biggest crashes ever, which I will explain by drawing pictures in Photoshop because it's all very confusing, but don't worry, I promise I make it really simple and easy to understand. But before we get into that, I wanna hear your honest opinions about the recent Bloomberg article talking about the four day work week and how difficult it is to find. Now the popularity of the four day work week absolutely skyrocketed during the pandemic when tons of people were remote which kind of makes sense because if you're at home working and there's nothing to do, you can pretty much just do whatever you want. You don't have to be pretending to work all the time like you would in an office environment. And the efficacy of this is backed up by surveys stating that almost half the workday is spent doing either menial tasks or just straight up not working. So moving from a five day work week down to a four day work week when really all you're doing is three days of work seems to make sense. But it also seems like companies just aren't willing to do this. Now the article states that despite a survey saying that a shortened work week is the most wanted recruitment and retention strategy, only 6% of senior leaders are even planning on it. Now, I think this news caught me and a lot of other people off guard because it really seemed like we were moving towards a four-day work week, especially with companies like Microsoft doing trial runs in Japan of a four-day work week, and they saw productivity jump by 40%. And they're not the only ones. Buffer is going on two years of a four-day work week, saying that 91% of the employees are happier and more productive working only four days. So again, I really want to know what you think about this. Would you like a four-day work week? Do you prefer five days? Why? Why, why not, or any other thoughts you might have in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to read every one of them, and while you're down there, you could subscribe. Next, let's talk about Tweet Daddy Elon Musk's big ticket Twitter takeover and how it's not happening? There's really too much going on with Elon and Twitter to give you any kind of a good overview quickly, but most recently, Elon stated that he was going to fire a ton of Twitter staff, force companies and governments to pay for Twitter accounts, and possibly stop paying the board a salary entirely, claiming that would save about $3 million per year. But now it looks like our savior Elon from the clouds is getting cold tweet feed and possibly is flying the coop on the whole deal. Now his official statement on the matter, which ironically came in the form of a tweet, says, quote, Twitter deal temporarily on hold pending details supporting calculation that spam slash fake accounts do indeed represent less than 5% of users. Now this is significant because it's very important for advertisers to know what percentage of a social media's platform is made up of real users and what percentage is just bots. And that way they know how much to pay for advertising because really you're only going to get anything out of it if a real person clicks on the ad, not if you just get spam clicks from bots. So with 229 million active Twitter users, 5% would represent about a million and a half bot accounts that really are kind of useless and can be disregarded. But with numbers this big, being off by just a few percent can result in millions upon millions of accounts being counted either as or not as bots, whether or not they actually are. And from a business standpoint, this absolutely makes sense to be worried about. Now, this announcement caused Twitter shares to absolutely tank by around 20% because investors who had bought Twitter stocks, thinking that Elon Musk would purchase those stocks from them and they would make a profit, are now worried that that's not gonna happen. So they're selling off in mass just in case Elon completely pulls out of this deal. As for my personal opinion on this, I'm doubtful, and I've got two main theories as to what's going on here. The first one is that Elon just can't secure enough funding for the deal. $44 billion is a lot of money, and it's possible he can't find it, and so he's looking for another way to back out that doesn't make him look so bad. This is important because if word were to get out that Elon couldn't find funding for a business deal, I would bet anything that Tesla stocks would absolutely tank. Again. My second theory is that Elon wants Twitter, but he doesn't want to pay as much as he had originally offered for the platform. So now he's giving reasons for why he might be doubtful about purchasing the platform in the form of saying it's a spam or bot issue, when really he just wants Twitter's stock to go down so that he can refile and purchase it for cheaper. And I'm pretty sure that second theory would actually be illegal, but Elon pretty consistently skirts on the edge of what's allowed, so I wouldn't put it past him. Now let's talk about the billionaire tax that Joe Biden has proposed, wherein people with a net worth of over $100 million would be taxed at at least 20% including taxes on unrealized gains. Now, quick finance lesson here so that we're all on the same page. Billionaires are currently able to skirt around tax laws by having almost all of their net worth tied up in stocks and unrealized gains rather than actually being tied up in cash. This means that they're paid with stocks in a company instead of being paid with a paycheck like most of us. So when the value of the company goes up and that stock value increases, they're not actually taxed on that because they haven't sold the stock. The amount by which the stock goes up without being sold is called an unrealized gain. However, so as not to ever have to sell stocks, what they do is they will borrow money from a bank 
against their stock, basically saying that if they can't pay back the loan, then the banks are allowed to take the stocks. Now, this is really good for the banks because it's essentially a no risk loan that they can just give to the billionaire. And it's good for the billionaires because you're not taxed on loans because those aren't considered income because you have to pay them back. They're just loans. So Biden has proposed a bill where all of your net worth over $100 million, no matter what it is, is taxed at 20%. And this would be the first time ever that unrealized gains have been taxed, which is why this is such a significant move. So while this didn't technically happen this week, and as such kind of goes against the format of the show, with midterms coming up, I'm betting we'll hear a lot of talk about this, especially since it's very popular with people on the left. Now, this bill isn't without its criticisms, however, with Harvard graduate and economics professor Brian Bernberg saying, quote, if you've got a nice house sitting there and it rises in value, we're going to take some of that money from you. That's a killer. That's a killer for wealth creation to tax wealth. Europe tried it. It didn't work. There's no reason we should be trying it. And now for my personal opinions, the first thing I would say is $100 million is more than just a nice house. Even in the most expensive housing markets, you can get an actual mansion for well below a tenth of that price. So claiming that anybody could really have a nice house that would drive their net worth over nine figures just seems so unrealistic. However, the Europe comment is actually correct and very interesting to look at in that in 1990, about a dozen European countries had a wealth tax, but now only three countries do. And that's basically because it just didn't work. However, one of the main reasons that it didn't work is in the European Union, you can pretty much just go from country to country and just move your wealth. So if the country that you're in is suddenly charging you 20%, you can just go to the country next door that isn't charging you 20%. Now, this would be a little more difficult in America because one, we're not part of the European Union, and two, Elizabeth Warren proposed an exit tax, wherein if you take your US assets and you try to move them overseas or just out of the country, then you would be charged at 40% of everything you're trying to move out, thus avoiding billionaires trying to just escape with their wealth. But honestly, for more details about how this all shapes up, we'll just have to wait and see. Now let's briefly talk about tech stocks being down as they've crashed by about $1 trillion over the last week. And I say let's talk about it briefly because honestly, there's just not much to say here. Apple has lost $220 billion. Microsoft has lost $189 billion. Tesla lost $199 billion. Amazon has lost $173 billion. And well, you get the idea. There's been a lot of red in the tech stock sector over the last week. Now, it's no great surprise that the companies that benefited most from the pandemic where we're all stuck inside would see their value slip as we no longer need their services as much. Now, couple this with rising interest rates from the Federal Reserve, and we see a lot of people shying away from these more volatile tech stocks. And they tend to be moving into safer stocks like Campbell Soup, General Mills, James Schmucker, all of which are in the green for this year. I can't imagine this crash will last much longer, however, and I think in the next few weeks we'll see a big rebound as people are buying at the dip because at the end of the day, these companies companies are still generating hundreds of billions of dollars in profit. So this crashing value really just seems like a very temporary thing. Next, let's talk about this massive crypto crash that caused KSI to lose three million dollars. And it's very confusing, but like I said at the beginning, I'm going to explain everything in Photoshop with drawn pictures so that you can very easily understand it and follow along with the story. So a general overview before I get into the nitty gritty and explain everything is Bitcoin crashed, which caused other people to get scared about smaller, lesser known coins and caused them to be sold off as well. And so they crashed. And when people saw other cryptocurrencies dropping, they sold off their cryptocurrencies and caused them to crash. And that led to this kind of death downward spiral as people kept getting scared and crashing and selling and so on and so forth. Now, to help you understand why this happened, I'm gonna jump into Photoshop and tell you exactly what went down while drawing pictures and also reading off of my script because this is very complicated, but I promise I can help you understand it. Okay, welcome back to the lesson today where I'm gonna try and teach you how all of this works. So the first thing we have to do is we have to define our terms. You need to know uh, fiat, stablecoin, and cryptocurrency. Okay, so our three terms here are fiat, stablecoin, and cryptocurrency. A fiat currency is any government issued currency. It's backed by the government and is generally very reliable. A stable coin is a coin that is pegged to the fiat and ideally trades at a one-to-one -one ratio. And I'll explain what that means in just a second. So don't worry about that. Basically, this means that one stablecoin should be worth one fiat, or in this case, one US dollar for one stablecoin. No matter what, we want one stablecoin worth one US dollar. Now, a cryptocurrency is just a digital asset that can be bought and sold 
like a stock. It's valuable because a large enough group of people agreed that it was valuable and agreed to act like it's valuable. Now going back to how staple coins are pegged to fiats or government issued currencies. Now there's a couple ways this can happen, but the only one we care about for this crypto crash is what's called an algorithmic peg. This is complicated, but stick with me here, I promise I'll make it understandable. So with a staple coin, when supply is low, but demand is high, the price will go up. But we don't want the price to go up because we want it to stay equal to the fiat currency. If it's one staple coin worth $1 and the price goes up, then it's no longer pegged to the dollar because it's now worth, say, $1.10. That's not what we want. So when that happens, an algorithm that controls the stablecoin allows you to trade $1 of the stablecoin for $1 of a cryptocurrency, and then you can sell that $1 of cryptocurrency for $1.01 of a fiat currency, in this case, the US dollar. Now this causes you to profit this one cent right here. So this pushes people to sell their coins for a tiny profit when the price starts to go too high. And that brings the price down because now supply is able to match demand because people sold their coins for a one cent profit. Now, opposite of that, when supply is too big, and we'll make a new thing here, and demand is too small, so more people want to sell than want to buy, then the price of the stable coin goes down. However, we don't want the price of the stable coin to go down because one stable coin has to equal one US dollar, otherwise it's not a stable coin. So then when this happens, the algorithm triggers another scenario where people can buy $1 worth of whatever cryptocurrency they're using for 99 cents, basically getting it at a one cent discount. That's a cent sign. So now people can buy $1 worth of cryptocurrency for only 99 cents. And this triggers people to start buying it because they're getting it at a discount, which leads to the supply going down as the demand goes back up, which then gets rid of this and causes the price to go back up preferably to that $1 mark that we want to be seeing it at because we want it to be equal to our $1 of fiat currency. Again, that's real money backed by the government. This algorithm is constantly working back and forth with this cryptocurrency, either making it more expensive or cheaper so that people will continue to buy and sell it for this staple coin that will cause them to make money with the US dollar. And that keeps it at exactly $1 with the staple coin. However, this staple coin did what's called depegging, wherein people were selling it, and so the price went down to encourage people to buy it, but people were so scared of it continuing to go down that nobody bought it. They just continued to sell and sell and sell, even though they were taking those losses at one cent per coin sold. And as more people sold, the algorithm kept pushing this price down and down to try and make people stay because if they sold, they would lose the money. However, people were so scared that the whole system was coming down that they continued to sell at a loss, fearing worse losses later, which they eventually got. So now that you understand, you need to know that UST is our staple coin and Luna is our cryptocurrency. So people got scared and started selling UST for Luna in order to sell Luna for US dollars. Now this caused the algorithm to make the price drop like I explained in the Photoshop lesson, but people were so scared, they didn't care that the price dropped and they were willing to sell at a loss. And now the cryptocurrency Luna has fallen from $73 last week to just four one thousandths of a dollar this week. And UST fell from the $1 mark where it was supposed to stay and supposedly pegged down to around 18 cents. People saw this massive crash and they panic sold every cryptocurrency fearing this kind of snowball effect that would cause everything to tank. And this has triggered a huge crypto wide crash. That's the end of the episode for today. And boy, howdy, what an episode it was. I would love to hear your thoughts on anything mentioned in this episode in the comments down below. Please subscribe if you'd like, and I will catch you all next week.